Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. St. Luke, the evangelist, is often referred to as the beloved physician. And that's because Paul in Colossians 4 refers to him that way. And St. Luke then presents us with Jesus. Jesus who gives us his healing medicine whose blood provides us the medicine of immortality. Luke is a traveling companion of Paul, and we heard him mentioned in that letter to Timothy. He traveled with Paul during the second missionary journey, joining him after Paul received his Macedonian call to bring the gospel to Europe. That's in Acts 16. Most likely, we have to kind of piece it together from the book of Acts, which is Luke's account of the event. Uh, Luke most likely stayed behind in Philippi, of course you know that as the letter to the Philippians, remaining there seven years and then rejoining Paul at the end of his third missionary journey in Macedonia. He then traveled with Paul to Troas, Jerusalem, and Caesarea, where Paul was in prison for two years, Acts 20 21. Then in Caesarea, Luke may have researched the material used for his gospel. That material, of course, is profound. What would Christmas be without hearing Luke's account of the birth of Jesus? How did he know so many details about Elizabeth and Zechariah and Mary and the angel? Well, the suggestion is that Luke, well, he interviewed the eyewitness of these events, namely the Virgin Mary herself. After Luke accompanied Paul on his journey to Rome, Acts 27 28, Especially beloved in Luke's gospel, then, are not only the birth story, but also uniquely his, the story of the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son, the rich man in Lazarus, the Pharisee and the tax collector. It's only Luke who also records the canticles of Mary, the Magnificat, or the canticle of Zechariah, the Benedictus, and of Simeon, the Nuptimitus, who we'll sing in a few minutes. To show how Christ continued his work in the early church through the apostles, who records for us the acts of the apostles, which I like to call Luke 1 and 2. More than one third of the New Testament then comes from the hand of the evangelist Luke. And the only one who wrote more would be the apostle Paul. Luke, the beloved physician, as referred to by St. Paul. What's notable is that Luke understood that the healing medicine is the preaching of the gospel. Now, at first glance, it doesn't seem that the gospel would bring healing. Of course, what do we need for healing? But medicine, drugs, as we call them today, and surgeons, and vaccinations, and well, other kinds of treatments for ailment, and even the chiropractor. These things can bring some relief to our body. But the problem is, is that the healing or the relief they give is only temporary. On Sunday we heard the story of Jesus healing a paralytic whom four friends, or presumably four but friends, brought on his pallet. And then in the parallel accounts, we heard Matthew, and in the other accounts, like Luke's, they actually removed some of the roof tiles or uh, thatch, and they lower the man down before Jesus because the, the home is so densely packed with people. And then if you remember what happens in that story, the first word that Jesus says to the man is quite remarkable. He says, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, the man is paralyzed lying on the bed. He's brought to Jesus clearly to be healed. But the first word that Jesus says to him is, Take heart, your sins are forgiven. To that, the, well, the third people in the room, the Pharisees and scribes, they think that Jesus is blaspheming. And they would be right if Jesus weren't the Son of God. Because only truly God can set aside sins. It's God's judgment against sins, and so only God then can set aside or set that, that judgment aside. But Jesus does it. And then they, of course, are confused and accuse him of blasphemy. He says, well, 
easier to say. Your sins are forgiven you, or Christ can hear them you are. And then to show them that he had the authority to forgive sins, which is the greater evil, he says to the young man, Christ can hear them you walk. And he did. He took up his bed, he put a pallet, and carried it with him, and went back home. The story is remarkable, of course, because Jesus can provide healing for the man's body, but it's not his first priority. This is also true for us. We have seems constant need for our bodies. Not just for the normal things that everybody needs, like, well, food and clothing and shoes and drink and house and home, and animals and all of the things that God provides, rain and sunshine and well, the good gifts of creation. But it seems that creation doesn't always go right, especially when it comes to our body. Uh, we grow old, or we're born with, with an illness, or an illness comes upon us. And in those times we want healing. And we know that true, lasting healing only can come from God. And so, of course, we include many in our prayers uh, each day in need of bodily healing, believing that God can provide that bodily healing just as He did for that, that man who was lying on the bed and his friends in glory before Jesus. But there is a greater healing that we need. And that healing, of course, is not just for the body, but for the whole person. The reason why we experience sickness, the reason why our bodies grow old and ultimately fail us and we die, is because of our sin. Thus says the universal testimony of the scripture. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift in Christ Jesus is eternal life. We need that eternal life. We need the greater resurrection, or the greater healing, we should say. The resurrection of the body. That priority is Jesus' first priority, too. And if he gives us healing, we thank God for that. We praise God for that. But if he chooses not to heal us and to allow us to continue to experience what Paul calls the thorn in the flesh, he would have us thank God for that, too. Because in trial and difficulty, even in sickness, he is wearing us down so that our trust and our hope will only be in Him. And especially in that promise of resurrection and life everlasting. The only way that we can have confidence in that promise is for Him to declare, as He has already today and will again in a few minutes, that our sins are forgiven. That He, Christ, has suffered, was crucified, died for our sins in our place, paid the full atonement price for those sins, and now has covered us with his blood, which atones for those sins. Of course, that's the washing of baptism. That he has declared to us our sins are forgiven, which pushes them as far from us as the farthest coast of the deepest sea. And that he will feed us with that forgiveness in his very body and blood, body and blood that was crucified, so that by eating his body and blood we are not only forgiven of our sins, but we have a promise of life. The greater healing he will accomplish already today by way of promise, having forgiven your sins, having died to forgive those sins. And with that, he may give you healing now for what he owes you. And if he does, thanks be to God. If he withholds that healing, we also thank God that as we suffer, he, well, hones our faith that we would always put our hope and trust in him. And not even hope in this life, but hope in the life to come. This is why the ancients, the fathers of our church, were called the Lord's Supper, in particular, the medicine of immortality. Not just medicine for the body, which actually it does as well. So we bring the sacrament to those who are sick. But especially medicine that gives us eternal life. Because where there is forgiveness of sins, it reminds us there is life and life everlasting. So frequently throughout Luke's gospel, we will find that he speaks of healing miracles. But the majority of the bulk of his gospel, of the gospel, is more precisely the gospel itself. Jesus Christ suffering and dying for the sins of the world. And with that forgiveness, he promises to give you the full healing, the complete resurrection. 
and eternal life on God's day. That's what Luke, the, the great the physician, would have you recognize Jesus as your great physician. Thanks be to Jesus and his holy name. Amen. Amen.